Okay, good morning to everybody. So I know it's very hard to be here at 8 o'clock in the morning, the very first day, but okay, here you are. So basically I will discuss with you some of the new insights we're having on the, the very close links between the biology function of ecosystem like the Amazon ecosystem and atmospheric chemistry aspects. So basically uh, we will follow uh, the, the route in, the, in this presentation, uh, studying f f starting from process that links the land atmosphere uh, feedbacks, then uh, global change because of, of course, Amazonia is suffering global change like all the other, all the other uh, different ecosystems, and how the societal new human activities, you know, enter on this, and how this uh, change in radiative forcing, that's a critical ingredient in the functioning of all ecosystem, and how does this feedback to the land atmosphere um, issues. So basically, we will go through this uh, system. And why Amazonia, in particular, is, uh, is, is, has important features on this uh, kind of links. First, uh, Amazonia is the most vigorous uh, hydrological cycle uh, on Earth. But uh, uh, there are evidence that the hydrological cycles in Amazonia is changing. We had the two most strong droughts in the last 100 years, just in, in 2005 and 2010. We had the two very strong floods in 2012 and 2009. So basically, there are evidence that the Amazonia could be changing in response to climate change. But also, uh, Amazonia, like, not like any other ecosystem, has very strong uh, links between the forest, the atmosphere, and climate, as the presentation, I hope, uh, will make very clear. And the interfaces between the biology, physics, and chemistry is particularly strong uh, in Amazonia. Within this context, of course, the aerosols are important into biogeochemical bio cycles, in radiative force, in cloud formation, in the links between the plants and the atmosphere, CCN, ice nuclei, and many different aspects, and the aerosols are critically important for the overall functioning of the ecosystem, and also the atmospheric chemistry in terms of VOC uh, emission from the plants itself, and how does this uh, produce aerosols and change all the previous properties of aerosols into the ecosystem. And then uh, the integration of biology into Earth system models that is just in its infancy actually have a major role in, uh, in Amazonia because it's a perfect open laboratory as I think we, we will become clear. So one main feature for Amazonia I think is that uh, the forest itself is the main source of water vapor to the atmosphere through evapotranspiration from the forest leaves but also is the source of trace gas uh, that becomes uh, secondary organic aerosol formation and also primary organic aerosol emissions that are responsible for large, for the giant CCN that can initiate precipitation very efficiently and also for the ice nuclei that makes the big uh, and deep convective clouds. So all this goes to the atmosphere, influences the cloud condensation nuclear concentrations that are the seeds for the clouds and feedback to the ecosystem through precipitation that is absolutely critical for the functioning of the ecosystem. But also Amazon is not isolated from the world, from all different pressures, so we're also studying how the transition from the natural ecosystem like this goes to degraded areas that are significant in Amazonia. So basically this is the framework we are uh, actually working with. So now going into more detail, <coughs> from the biogenic emission from, sp from spores, pollen, bacteria into uh, as a primary biological aerosol particles. They get coated by several sugars present in the atmosphere and, and become more soluble. They are getting uh, more efficient as CCN and they are more efficient to uh, nucleate cloud droplets. So this goes to the cloud and then there are several feedback loops but most interesting, that we also have the biogenic salts like potassium, like phosphorus, like ammonia, uh, that are released by the plants that can feed very, very small particles and also participate in the secondary organic aerosol production as the paper uh, from Chris Poker uh, recently have shown very clearly. Another way of looking to the ecosystem 
is what the Anki Nongsher have done, uh, looking into the total OH reactivity from the biological functioning for the forest to the atmospheric chemistry links to the physics of the atmosphere. Of course, OH is a critical ingredient in all process in the oxidation of most of the gaseous compound into the atmosphere through a series of, of reactions, some of them mediated by uh, nitrogen compounds, and uh, producing ozone, that's a critical ingredient in the oxidizing capacity of Amazonia. And then this, of course, influences secondary organic aerosols, clouds, and precipitation. So uh, primary biological aerosol particles, they are everywhere uh, in the world. They, they have a significant low, uh, loading into the atmosphere as fungal spore emissions, especially in Amazonia, uh, uh, the tropical Africa, and also uh, Southeast Asia tropical forest. But you see that the concentrations are very significant in Amazonia uh, overall. And we are designing several experiments, like the Go Amazon that Alan uh, mentioned, but several others, like Amazi, into studying the aerosol and cloud life cycles in a very integrated way, taking into account as, as comprehensive as, as possible approach to really have a full understanding of the equilibrium uh, reactions that controls the atmosphere composition uh, in Amazonia. And this goes through several multi-phase process. This is what makes this process uh, pretty complex, from liquid to solid uh, reactions in addition to the gases. And then we have uh, emissions and deposition that are basically controlled by the biological activity and feedbacks. And this is a very, very dynamic system. The reactions can be much faster than in other regions. And also, the feedbacks can be uh, much faster. And also, uh, in addition to the natural biological functioning of, of Amazonia, let's not forget the us as human beings. We are present in Amazonia in a significant way. So actually, Amazonia can also be seen as a region uh, in transition because uh, a lot of different uh, activities like agricultural expansion, logging, and also global climate change influence into a series of different process that, he, uh, that he regulates the ecosystem functioning and having several different effects that are already observed by both statistical uh, variability uh, into Amazonia. So the interactions between land use change and climate change is a major driver for changes in Amazonia. And this study should be integrated into the biological functioning uh, of the forest. And in Amazonia, you have basically three types of, of aerosol particles. The biogenic component, both primary biological particles like this, and also secondary organic aerosols that comprise most of the aerosol number and also mass. But you also have the biomass burning component that will well study uh, along many, many ways. And Amazonia is not isolated from, from the globe. So we have dust from Sahara that's an important source for ice nuclei uh, into Amazonia, as several of our studies have shown. So basically, each of these di components have very different properties, uh, very different impacts. And the size of these particles grows from 1 nanometers to 10 micrometers. So they go to a huge uh, change uh, in different scales. Amazonia have reduced, Brazil have reduced the forestation in Amazonia uh, very significant from 27,000 square kilometer to about uh, 4,000 square kilometer. So this has changed dramatically the picture of the site, but uh, sometimes in a quite unpredictable way, as we're going to see uh, later on in, in the presentation. So basically here, you see 14 years of continuous aeronet measurements in Amazonia. So one of the things we see that in 2007, this is daily average. So these are not instantaneous values. Instantaneous values can go up to 5.5 or 6 in terms of AUD at 550 nanometers. So very high aerosol optical depth. But you see that the decrease in the forest in, in AOD is not as high as the decrease in six times in deforestation rates. So basically, there was a shift from uh, deforestation 
mitigation fires that were predominant 10 years ago to actually pasture manage management fires that are predominantly over the last four or five years. But even with all this reduction, we still see significant aerosol optical depth over large areas uh, in Amazonia. So to study these uh, issues and to put it then in a scientific context, we are operating right now in Amazonia a total of six different measurement sites that are operating continuously. It's not easy to operate these things in the middle of the jungle continually for 10, 15 years. But uh, some of the sites are very far away, like the Ato site, that uh, we are building a tower, 320 meters tall tower, that should be ready by this December, that will be a permanent laboratory in Amazonia. But in addition to that, we have uh, stations like the ZF2, where the amazing experiment was done, and we are doing continuous aerosol measurements since 2008. And then several different sites urban sites and also downwind of Manaus as part of the Go uh, Amazon experiment. So I will present some of the data before and then after the Manaus plume. So this is the kind of laboratory we, start, we install in the middle of, of the jungle. It's one of our containers at ZF2. So this is an ACSM, and high resolution AMS, PTRMS, several optical measurements, uh, t on for aerosol mass, and so on. So we need these dedicated instruments operating over four, five, or 10 years to really understand the process that regulates atmospheric chemistry in Amazonia. Transport in Amazonia is also something very peculiar. So we see, for instance, these are basically six months backward trajectories from Manaus. So you see that you have a very persistent uh, pathway from the top tropical Atlantic into uh, Manaus. And before reaching Manaus, the air mass travel for 2,500 kilometers of just forest. No urban center in between, no uh, local contamination. So this makes it a perfect laboratory to study this kind of thing. And if you go uh, the influence function for the Manaus footprint, you see that you cover a significant fraction of the Amazon forest, especially the Amazon part that is undisturbed in very natural conditions. And how is the aerosol size distribution for this uh, pristine environment? So in the wet season, we have a predominance of coarse mold particles. This is about uh, 7 to 8 nanograms, micrograms per cubic meter. Most of them primary biological particle. A small fraction is mineral dust. Most of it transported from Sahara into Amazonia. And in the fine mold, you have the secondary organic aerosol dominates about 75 to 8% of the fine mold mass. So basically, uh, you see from the aerosol composition and size distribution that actually the role of biology is very important into the aerosol uh, composition and size. If you look at your long term, this is four years of aerosol mass concentration uh, north of Manaus in a pristine area. You see that during the dry season, you see the regular increase, a slight increase, not as dramatic as you see in southern part of Amazonia. But we also see a constant coarse mold uh, particles that are mostly biogenic, as I mentioned, 7 to 10 microgram per cubic meter. And this is black carbon, mostly in defined particles, as you can see here. Uh, through the four-year cycle, but also we have absorption by these coarse mold particles that is very significant uh, in Amazonia. These coarse mold particles is mostly consisted of primary biological aerosol particles, and most of these particles fluorescence on the UV uh, type of analysis, and the size distribution is centered about 2, 2.5 <coughs> micrometers, so by several different uh, studies. And if you do analysis <coughs> with the uh, wide use bioaerosol sensor, WIBS3. So basically, you see this is a diurnal variability. You see that most of the particles are really actually released at nighttime as part of nighttime biological process. 
So basically you see that the fluorescence particles in terms of concentration and time of the day, they predominate during night time. They are very much reduced by factor of five during daytime, and then as soon as the sun goes down, it, it goes back. Uh, the non-fluorescence coarse mode particles has a relatively constant uh, concentration. She, uh, this is again an evidence of the relevance of primary biological particles into this uh, particular ecosystem. And on the fine mode, most of the particles came as a secondary organic aerosol from the oxidation <laughs> of, of VOCs, in particular isoprene and monoterpenes. Isoprene uh, through three different uh, Heights into the, the forest, they peak at one o'clock. Uh, monoterpenes peaks later at, at five o'clock for all the different levels. Uh, but uh, we see enhanced concentration at the canopy level, and there is much, much more detail on this kind of measure to the poster of Ana Maria uh, Serrano there. So you see that during the dry season and the wet season, uh, the vertical profile is associated with biogenic emissions with slightly higher uh, dry season concentration than uh, in the wet season. And one of the issues in Amazonia is that we do not observe on the ground, or very rarely to be more precise, uh, new particle formation. Uh, and this is still a uh, question why we don't observe in new particle formation, as you see in boreal forest in a very frequent way. So uh, basically, Possibly because we have very low SO2 concentration, so concentration of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere is pretty low. And also, uh, the, co the organic concentration of the materials uh, uh, is, is very, very difficult for them to go to a stable cluster where they could uh, form uh, newly formed nanometer sized particles. But uh, right, one an another hypothesis is that these particles are not formed on the ground, but they are formed on the free troposphere, and through downdraft, they could come down already, grow it up. But the last week, measurements in the Go Amazon to the German hollow plane and the DOE also went up to 15 kilometers, and we did not find these particles there also. So basically, uh, still remain uh, a mystery how these particles are forming. What we observe, that is a relatively weird kind of characteristics, is this kind of nighttime burst of 20 to 40 nanometers particle that show up uh, quickly, and then for one hour or two hours, they just disappear. We don't see this banana as you see in Hutiala. So basically, the nature of this kind of, of event is still uh, unknown. Uh, but what we know is that, for instance, they are very frequent. So this is daily uh, size distribution. Sometimes they appear a little bit higher in size, 40 nanometers. But you see that if you take into the frequency of these events, uh, this is the percentage of particles with diameter from 10 to 40 nanometers, measuring over three years in the AMAZE site. So basically, sometimes you see for, for the wet season, they can account for 40 to 50 percent in terms of uh, frequency. So they are very frequent, that happens frequently, and we really don't know why uh, the nature of these uh, particles. Another curiosity of the Amazonian part uh, of the Amazonian aerosol, maybe it's a peculiarity of these particles is that even very, very small, 20 to 40 nanometers uh, secondary organic aerosol particles uh, were measured as containing small amounts of potassium uh, in 95% of the particles. So they are not pure organic particles, but they have very, very, very small amounts of potassium that, of course, came from the vegetation itself. So actually, to, uh, to show uh, the process that could make this potassium produce organic aerosol is also a critical area that we still uh, do not understand pretty well.
In terms of aerosol size distribution in general, so basically this is aeronet size distribution, very similar to uh, ground-based SNPS. You see the secondary organic aerosol in the fine mode for the wet season, and then you see the primary biological particles. And in the dry season, we see an enhanced fine particles because of the biomass burning contribution, and a similar uh, mode for the primary biological particles as same features we see uh, into the filters. When you look into this size distribution uh, in, in very much detail, you see there's a function, uh, as a function of time, we'll see changes from the Aitken mode to the accumulation mode as we go over the day uh, during the wet season, and we see quite significant cloud processed particles in the wet season that you don't see during the dry season. Look that the scales are very, very much different in the, into the dry seal just to see the transport of aged uh, biomass burning particles. And as a function of local time, we see that the particles do increase, uh, especially in the wet season, uh, the, the average particle size, so they, ha they are subjected to photochemistry uh, process. In terms of optical properties, uh, there are some interesting features. Also, this is light scattering measured over five years in, in that site, and this is light absorption. So basically, you see an enhancement during the dry season due, due to the biomass burning. But in terms of absorption, we also see here in February and March an enhancement of absorption, possibly due to the long range transport of biomass burning from Africa that brings together with Sahara dust into Amazonia this type of aerosol, and also some absorption due also to the dust itself. So uh, curiously, if you look into single scattering albedo, you see that the single scattering albedo over the wet season is sporadically when this kind of events happens, uh, they uh, decrease the single scattering albedo very much comparing to the dry season that you have a single scattering albedo of 0.90 to 0.92. So a pretty scattering aerosol due to the presence of organic particles. If you look into the large scale picture, as we are looking to running several stations, we can compare uh, analysis of two sites 100 kilometers apart, that is the ATO site versus the TT34 site, the ZF2 site. You see a remarkable similarities between the concentration for the two sites. So basically meaning that uh, this is not the locally produced aerosol. So actually this responds to the local, to the large area forcing. And uh, the particle scattering is the same picture as the particle absorption. So basically also in terms of organic composition of aerosol, we'll see of 81% uh, of uh, wet season aerosol is dominated by organic particles, very small sulfate, 8.6%, and very small, even small uh, nitrate concentrations. And most of the, of the aerosol is highly oxidized, so this means it's an aged aerosol that has suffered quite significant oxidation process for both the ZF2 and also uh, for the ATO site. And how is the link between these features and the hydrological cycle? So basically, you have the evidence that the hydrological cycle is intensified, so as a response for tropical Atlantic sea surface temperature. And the issue is, how does this link with the, the cloud uh, property? So basically, it's also important to understand that Amazonia is critically important to, into the transport a process from uh, water vapor here to the uh, food production area of North Argentina and also Southern Brazil. And Ilan Coren, a few years ago, showed very nice features of the effects of aerosols, both on cloud drop pressures and also on cloud diffraction, where cloud diffraction, if you add a little bit of aerosol, can change for 25% up to 60% because there are plenty of water vapor and they are depleted in terms of aerosol particles. But very non-linear process because as you increase the amount of aerosols, the droplets starts to evaporate and then this is extremely difficult to model uh, into the global model. And how is the effect 
effect of the particles in Amazonia into the water cycle down in, in South America. So recently, Maria Assunção have done a, a paper where she compared the aerosol optical depth into, in several sites in Amazonia, and actually rainfall rate measured by TRIM in the La Plata Basin, and they saw a significant reduction in precipitation in the La Plata Basin associated with biomass burning uh, aerosols uh, in Amazonia. I will start skipping some of the transparencies. So basically, this is show also the relevance of aerosol from both biogenic and also soil dust as a nice nuclei that are critically important for the formation of deep convective clouds in Amazonia. These aerosol particles also have very important effects and impacts on the radiation balance. And, uh, uh, recent work from Elisa Sena showed that the direct radiative force of aerosols in Amazonia over large areas can reach average of minus 12 watts per square meter, average for the whole dry season. So it's a very significant uh, radiative force if you take in account the effect of, of CO2 is about 2.6 uh, watts per square meter. And this, in addition to the aerosols, also land use change change the radiative forcing strongly, also water vapor effects change the radiative forcing, and there is a, a poster here from Elisa uh, discussing how we have integrated uh, the biospheric components, aerosols and water vapor. And then just to finish, the, in the end, you know, the, this radiation uh, meets uh, uh, photosynthesis through <coughs> the several different process. And then there are several feedback loops into the diffusion global radiation. And we have observed very strong effects of aerosol loading into the atmosphere into net ecosystem exchange. So this is affecting the photosynthetic rate of the forest uh, very, very significantly. And then uh, we are just finishing the Go Amazon project. So basically, it's looking to the effect of an uh, urban area like in Manaus, downwind. How does this affect the atmospheric chemistry and aerosols? These are the results of more than 120 different flight patterns that we flew from Manaus, downwind of Manaus. Uh, with the three uh, different airplanes. So right now, this week, you have the German Hello airplane flying there, also the DOE G1 plane. And uh, last year, we had the BA-146, just to analyze the large scale aerosol and trace gases in Amazonia. So this is the pattern that you flew over uh, with the G1 in one of the flights in March 16. And this is CPC counts from uh, Manaus City, over the T2 sites that were operating, that is downwind from the sea, you see a huge increase in CPC, and they are getting diluted uh, over the uh, area. But you also see uh, interesting gradients in terms of isoprene concentrations, high concentrations over pristine forest area, and isoprene actually being reacted with the products from the Manaus area uh, and producing many different compounds. Uh, we see toluene also as, as a tracer for urban emission from Manaus. But you see production of uh, acetone. We see production of MVK. And the ratio between them varies a lot with the different isoprene and the concentration. So the synetics is very complex. This is what we are trying to study. And the uh, flight of March 17, for instance, this is the flight pattern, also show uh, <coughs> this is Manaus, and this is downwind of Manaus, this is Manacapuru, also show very clearly the uh, effects of aerosols on the Manaus plume. And again, a similar picture, isoprene being consumed down here, and with high concentration outside the Manaus plume, and low concentration uh, into the plume. So basically, this just shows us that the biological, the chemical, and the physical processes are extremely tied into Amazonia. And they, f they, they form a pretty uh, complex system that are now just starting to understand. And also, I will direct you to about 45 papers with additional results over the conference for many students and other researchers uh, into the project. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, 
we have time for a couple of questions. We've got uh, someone walking around with a mic, so if you have a question, please raise your hand really high, and uh, she'll bring you the microphone right there. Again, thank you for a very interesting talk. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the plot that showed the response of NEE, Net Ecosystem Exchange, to radiation? Was that response species dependent, or was it simply a function of the total flux coming into the canopy? No, it's a function, actually, of the ratio between diffuse and direct radiation. So we find out that the photosynthesis is very much sensitive on this ratio. Of course, also you have effects of temperature, you also have effects of relative humidity, but the most important factor is the increase in diffuse radiation due to the uh, loading of the aerosols. And Surprisingly, the photosynthesis for some of the LBA towers measuring over 10 years of average can change between 23% to 45% enhanced photosynthesis, enhanced carbon uptake. So it's a very strong number. So that meaning that the aerosols has a very important impact in the carbon cycle in Amazonia. Thank you. I will take one more question for Paulo. I see one right there. You mentioned that uh, over the forest, the biological particles are max have a maximum during the night. Is that because the forest is most active in producing them during the night, or is it related to the boundary layer? Uh, uh, no, it's not related to the boundary layer, because we see the enhancement mostly at ground below the canopy. So basically, it's actually a night nighttime activity of fungus that release spores, and they are also reaching phosphorus very curiously, you know. We see an enhancement of 10 times at nighttime in phosphorus up below the canopy that we don't see above the canopy. And phosphorus is the limiting nutrient for Amazonia. So it's curious why the forest, the, the microorganism, will release such important element at nighttime. And mostly they do that to avoid the daytime co convection to avoid losing this phosphorus, you know, uh, to the outside ecosystem. So this is basically could be a way of uh, evolution to preserve the nutrient cycle inside the Amazonia. But this is a feature that we still do not understand properly. Thank you very much, Paulo, for an excellent talk and for opening.